Hello everyone and welcome to the seventh episode in our AI and You podcast series. Today is Monday, August 24th, 2020, and I'm your host, Vikar Saidi. I'm a computer scientist and engineer, a lecturer and a consultant. I'm also the author of several books. My most recent book is about artificial intelligence and is titled The Genome Affair. The Genome Affair is a work of speculative fiction. It examines what the world might be like if some of the more extraordinary capabilities forecast to be realized in AI over the next 20 or 30 years were actually realized today. Given the growing list of frightening existential threats humankind now faces, the book pays particular attention to the impact AI is expected to have on world affairs. The book is available in ebook format for those who prefer to read on a digital device, but it's also available in a high quality paperback edition. The Genome Affair is available on Amazon, so I hope you'll take the time to read it and to leave a review. Book reviews are very helpful for writers. I'm available to give talks on artificial intelligence and its related technologies and on the impact AI is expected to have on our world. If you'd like to get in touch with me to arrange an event or consulting meeting at your company or organization, you can find my contact info in the podcast notes below. And now, on to today's podcast. In our last podcast, episode 6, I talked about how the nascent technology of quantum computing could make artificial intelligence unimaginably more powerful as it proceeds on a path towards its ultimate goal of achieving superintelligence. I also talked about how another nascent technology, blockchain, enabled by artificial intelligence, might revolutionize world trade. Finally, I touched on the impact these technologies will have or perhaps should have, on governance. In today's podcast, Episode 7, I'll talk more about human intelligence and the rich varieties of intelligence that are present in Homo sapiens. I'll also talk about the popular perception of intelligence and how this has influenced society and what it means to our future in a world of ever-increasing narrow and then general AI agents. I'll close with a discussion about how humankind has, for most of history, believed that intelligence resides in the heart rather than in the brain. Let's get started. In the world in which we now live, there is widespread belief that there are essentially two types of intelligence. The first is quantitative analysis and processing capacity, and the second is reading comprehension or what's often called linguistic intelligence. In fact, entrance exams at various levels in the education system largely focus on assessing these two forms of intelligence or ability. If a student performs well in either or both of these areas, they tend to secure admission in the best universities and the best academic programs within these universities. Those that perform less well on these standardized assessments are directed towards second or third tier academic institutions and programs, vocational programs involving apprenticeships, or towards manual labor. But this wasn't always the case. In fact, a little over a century ago, students applying for admission to Harvard needed to demonstrate significant depth and proficiency in Greek. Hebrew and Latin civilization, culture and language. In particular, there was no formal assessment of their quantitative analytical skills. In fact, students with a high degree of mathematical prowess rarely hold deep knowledge of these antiquated languages, along with the historical record of humankind with which they're so closely associated. But the extraordinary changes in society these past 300 years or so, and the three phases of industrial revolution that have followed, have resulted in the need for a different set of skills amongst the population and workforce. 
in the future, as general artificial intelligence agents begin to proliferate in the broader society, specifically in the workplace, we are likely to find that human proficiency in analytical problem solving based upon the optimal management and synthesis of vast and complex data sets is outmatched by AI agents by many orders of magnitude. Thus, our societies will eventually shift. We may once again allocate a lower social value to analytical ability than we presently do. Jeffrey Gardner, a scientist at Harvard, has studied human intelligence for the past three decades. Gardner believes that there are at least eight and possibly 10 or even 12 different types of human intelligence. Our intelligence is not simply characterized by quantitative and reading comprehension. What we know from artificial intelligence thus far is that it can replicate the quantitative dimension of human intelligence very well. AI is currently very good at simulating the neural network found in the human brain. But as we've discussed in previous podcasts, human thought and intelligence is not purely rational. That is, there's a complex and nuanced relationship between the cortex, the mammalian brain, the limbic system, and the reptilian brain, with each layer playing some role in our intelligence and judgment. Beyond this, we also need to consider that the various other forms of intelligence identified by Gardner also play an important role in human thought, intelligence, and hence decision-making. Let's take a few minutes to, to discuss these other forms of human intelligence. The first is bodily intelligence. Bodily intelligence can be found in athletes, dancers, craftsmen, and sculptors. These people can use their bodies and limbs to do extraordinary things in the arts, in sports, and other areas that are impossible for most of us. Existential intelligence. These are people who often ponder large philosophical questions such as, what is the meaning of life? Or, or why do we die? Why do people hurt other people? These people detain, these people tend to take a very broad view in trying to understand contemporary or complex issues. They may want to frame the question in a very broad historical context. Interpersonal intelligence. These people have the ability to understand and to communicate and collaborate with others to a very high degree. People with a high degree of interpersonal intelligence may be very adept at leading teams battalions, or even entire societies. Intrapersonal intelligence. These are people who understand themselves to a very high degree. As Socrates had said, know thyself. These people can make very good decisions about what they ought to be doing with their lives and their time, such that they find fulfillment in what they do, much more so than others. They tend to find great meaning and purpose in what they do and in their lives. Musical Intelligence This is the ability to conduct or write musical compositions and to play one or more musical instruments very well. Natural Intelligence These people understand the physical environment and world around them. They may be very comfortable in the natural world. They may explore the sea and work with marine animals, or like Dr. Jane Goodall, they may spend their entire lives studying chimpanzees in Gombe National Forest in Tanzania. Pedagogical Intelligence This is the ability to teach others very well. We often find professors in the university who have tremendous reputations for their research and scholarship, and we are anxious to take a course with them or to conduct our dissertations under their guidance, only to find out that they are dismal teachers. Pedagogy is not a trait that automatically appears in the community of reputable academics. 
Spatial Intelligence Players of Go or chess have spatial intelligence, as do surgeons, ship captains, and airplane pilots. Now, Some may argue that this list is less one of newly identified forms of intelligence, but rather a list of talents. Of course, we can then counter the argument by asserting that if this is simply a list of talents, then why do we not also consider analytical prowess or reading comprehension to be talents? Either they are all forms of intelligence, or they are all talents. Now let's talk a bit about the historical understanding of where intelligence resides in Homo sapiens. According to scientists, including Matthew Cobb at the University of Manchester in the UK, for most of human history, indeed until, ne until nearly the end of the 18th century, scholars believed that human ideas, thought, and intelligence took place in the heart. This is why we find so many cultural references to the heart across the world amongst very different societies and virtually no cultural ref references to the brain. This probably has to do with the fact that when we feel excitement, fear, or sadness, there is a response in our heart rate and no noticeable response in our brain. Some phrases that demonstrate this phenomenon well are take it to heart, heartbroken, heart to heart con conversation, learn by heart, lose heart, and of course a personal favorite from the film Titanic, my heart will go on. The belief that intelligence and thinking were centered in the heart goes as far back as Aristotle. But this notion was challenged by thinkers throughout the ages and fell flat due to an inability to offer conclusive evidence. This only happened in the late 18th century. We can see the tussle between those believing in intelligence centered in the heart versus the head even in the works of William Shakespeare. In his play The Merchant of Venice, Act 3, Scene 2, Shakespeare writes, Tell me where is fancy bred, or in the heart, or in the head. How begot, how nourished, it is engendered in the eyes, with gazing fed, and fancy dies, in the cradle where it lies. Let us all ring fancy's knell. I'll begin it, ding dong bell, ding dong bell. Finally, in 1775, the British scientist and theologian Joseph Priestley wrote, In my opinion, there is just the same reason to conclude that the brain thinks as that it is white and soft. There is no instance of any man retaining the faculty of thinking when his brain was destroyed. And whenever the faculty is impeded or injured, there is sufficient reason to believe that the brain is disordered in proportion. And therefore, we are necessarily led to consider the latter as the seat of the former. That is to say, the brain is the seat of thought and intelligence. As we continue to consider human intelligence more deeply, we can see the complexity that artificial intelligence researchers are faced with every day as they endeavor to simulate human intelligence in deep learning neural networks. Thank you for spending some time with me. I'm trying to follow the TED Talk format, and so I'm keeping these podcasts to about 20 minutes. Let me know what you think. I hope you'll find these insights into artificial intelligence helpful, and I hope you'll read my new book, The Genome Affair. It's on, an it's on Amazon. Until next time, then, this has been the AI and You podcast with Vikar Saidi.